I invite you to bow with me as I pray the 19th Psalm. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O God, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Water is one of the great metaphors in the Bible. It's everywhere. Um, interesting that the primary things that keep us alive are the key metaphors in the Bible. Breath, air, the Holy Spirit, water, knowing how important it is for water in our lives, what, 80, 85% of our bodies is water, and uh, food, uh, the bread of life. They say you can't go longer than three minutes without air, three days without water, or three weeks without food. Those are, those are the foundations of our life, of living itself, and in the scriptures they are woven into beautiful metaphor after beautiful metaphor. We're exploring the water metaphor during Lent for the next several weeks with hydrate, renewal by water, and the spirit. And today I want to read about the wedding at Cana in the Gospel of John. John has more metaphors per minute than anybody else. And John's Gospel is a little different than the others. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are considered the synoptic Gospels, simply meaning a synopsis of the history, historic Gospels, about what Jesus did in his ministry. John's Gospel is more of an interpretive Gospel. So Mark is the shortest, it's the, um, it's the most concise and the first written. I think the concise part is why my parents named me Mark. And then you have Matthew and Luke, which expound on that history. And they were written later. And then the Gospel of John was written last, perhaps as much as a generation later. And that Gospel of John has many more metaphors um, and is more of a, an interpretation of Jesus' life than a history of Jesus' life. But in John, the first miracle well, I'll give you an example. You didn't ask for one, but you said, really? I'll say, I'll give you an example. So in Matthew and Luke, there's a strong history of the birth narratives of Jesus. Mark doesn't have those, and neither does John. But the birth of Jesus is pretty important to Matthew and Luke. John skips that entirely and talks about, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. More of an interpretation of who Jesus is than the history of his life. But the first miracle that Jesus performs in the Gospel of John is the wedding at Cana, where he transforms water into wine. This is a great story. It's not a good, it's not a good handbook for how to talk to your mother. Um, but since it's Jesus, I guess we can't criticize, right? But Jesus' uh, words to his mother are, I find, a little comical. Um, so I would ask you to stand as you are able for the reading of the Holy Gospel. John chapter 2, 1 and following. On the third day, there's a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, and don't you know the wine's going to give out. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they're out of wine. And Jesus said to his mom, woman? Oh, huh, what? What concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. And his mother said to his servants, ignoring Jesus entirely, do what he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said, now t draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. And when the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone else serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until last. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. 
And after this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother, his brothers, and his disciples, where they remained a few days. Here ends this reading. Amen. Please be seated. So not only is Jesus asking them to fill jars with water, this is the bath water. This is the, these are the jars for the purification rites. This isn't the drinking water jars. These are the big barrels for drinking water, or for, for washing. And so he says, fill the tub with water. And he turns that into wine. Now, I would say just turning any water into wine, a flask of water would be great. But the whole tub for the party is even more remarkable. And I love this. I love this interchange between Jesus and his mom. His mom says they're out of wine. He says, it's not your problem. She says, he's going to tell you what to do. And then Jesus tells him what to do. So mom gets her way at the end. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So what I, want to, what I want to talk about this story is, this story is a great metaphor for transformation in our lives. And what has happened to the miracles over time is people get bogged down in the miracles. There was, there was a time when people didn't worry about this because there wasn't any science. And so people would say, Jesus turned water into wine, and everybody would go, okay, because miracles happened all the time. Well, somewhere around 1500, at the same time as the Protestant Reformation, there was this move to science and a desire to explain the world. And so now people started explaining things. And really we took two paths. One took a path of embracing science and embracing new ways of understanding things and justifying things through science. And one took the path of saying science isn't true. Now, there is a pre-Protestant spirituality that the Catholic Church has maintained that actually is a gift to the Church that the Protestants lost because when we threw off the Catholic Church, we threw out, as they say, the baby with the bathwater and stopped our understanding of spirituality and this tension between spirituality and, and science that the Catholic Church has actually embraced in its time much more effectively than I believe the Protestants have. Though they struggled with it like everyone does, um, the whole idea of the sun going around, not going around the earth, took them a little while to get through that. But by and large, the Catholic Church has embraced science to this day more than some Protestant groups have. So here's your choice. And you can have a third choice. These aren't the only choices. So you get to decide. For some, it's very important that Jesus literally turned water into wine and it happened historically. And that proves that Jesus is the Son of God. For others, that bothers them because science, that's hard to get their head around. And so they will say, well, maybe there was some misunderstanding. And I've heard this sermon where someone talks about the misunderstanding there really was wine. I doubt it. It's either, a, it's either a miracle or it's not. But here's the issue is, I, it doesn't bother me. These things actually, when I was in high school, not high school, seminary, college and seminary, these things really bothered me. So I had to figure out what do you do with the miracles because for one group it proves Jesus is Lord and for another group it says, well, the Bible doesn't make any sense because it's saying stuff that's not possible, right? So people were throwing out the Bible and saying it can't be true because Jesus' miracles aren't true. Another group saying, well, science isn't true. What? So here's, my, here's what I've come to, and this is my great truth revealed for the sermon. I'm putting it in the middle of the sermon, I'm revealing the great truth. I'm not saving it to the end. The great truth is, I don't know. Now, the good news is, that doesn't bother me anymore. There was a time that it really bothered me not to know. And saying, I don't know. But what I've realized as I'm getting older is what I don't know is so much more abundant than what I do know, I should get more comfortable with it. Yes? I don't know. But what I do think is while we're trying to decide 
whether or not the wine, water turned into wine, we're missing the opportunity to see Jesus transforming grace in our lives. And it, when, when the story becomes a distraction one way or another, and there's distractions out there. I mean, we got people still looking for the Ark of Noah. And God bless them, I hope they find it. But they're out there digging everywhere. They're going to find that ark. Nah, I doubt it. But good for them. But they want to prove that it's true, that if they can have some archaeological evidence to show the miracles, the miracle of God, in my mind, need not be proven scientifically in order to be true. And the miracle here is Jesus is about to embark on a ministry of transformation and the water into wine was just the beginning. And I'll say this too, I wanna, I wanna speak up on behalf of metaphors. Metaphorical truth is more important than historical truth. Let me say that again. Metaphorical truth is more important than historical truth. And I'll give the example of the prodigal son. This is my favorite one. Prodigal son, he's kind of a deadbeat. He leaves, he takes half his dad's money, which is a miracle that his dad gave him half his money. He wastes it all and he comes back and his dad welcomes him. Did that actually happen? Who cares? What really happened is the image of the metaphor of God loving us and welcoming us back any time. It's possible that that really happened and that there was a really great dad who was an, a metaphor then for God. But the metaphor about God loving us is so much more important than whether or not that, then maybe Jesus just made that story up to make an illustration. Now, I know that might upset some people, but maybe, I don't know. So again, I say, I don't know. But this story of the water into wine is so powerful, I just want to put the science aside first and just dive in, if you will, into the power of this. Jesus has a way of making the ordinary extraordinary. And that miracle is true. If all that happened in Cana was that Jesus turned water into wine and turned out to be the best party host ever, that's not much of a story, is it? I mean, that's a good news. That's great. But if the message is Jesus can take us in clay jars, Filled not even with the purest water, but with bath water. And can transform us into something wonderful. And not even okay wine. Okay, not even wine in a box. Okay, we're not talking about box wine here. We're talking about the best wine. And the steward was overwhelmed. I'm sorry, am I insulting people with box wine? We have a joke in our family because my aunt believes wine only belongs in a box. But anyway, it's a whole other story. But the steward is so amazed, he goes to the bridegroom and says, I can't believe this. Everybody else puts the good wine first, and then after everybody's drunk, I guess that happened back then too, after everybody's drunk, then you bring out the bad wine and finish them off, right? But you've saved the very best for last. This was better than the wine we had before. And it came out of the tub. The miracle of this is that Jesus takes our lives. And even in the midst of tragedy that we all experience, and the midst of loss, and the midst of brokenness, and the midst of doing really dumb things that we're all capable of doing, God still takes that and transforms it into the best than even what it was before. And it is true, isn't it, that the wisdom we earn, because you don't get wisdom for free, amen? 
The wisdom we earn somehow gives us a depth and a faith that's far greater and far richer than what we had before. That's a miracle. That's a miracle. Opening ourselves to our lives being transformed by Jesus Christ, not just made okay, not just taped back together, but transformed into something wonderful, is a miracle that Jesus offers each of us. We're going to receive communion today. And isn't the church worked up about what communion means? And so there have been splits, there have been people mad. When you receive communion today, I believe it is less about what happens to the water or the wine and the bread and more what happens to us when we receive it. In, um, in the Catholic tradition, um, they use science to understand the, tr- the change in, and actually not really science, but more metaphysical philosophy from Aristotle, that the bread and wine are actually trans, uh, through transfiguration, not transfiguration, transubstantiation, are actually changed because it's changed in the spiritual metaphysical sense, and therefore the manifestation becomes the actual body and blood of Christ. Um, you want me to say that again? So in Aristotelian, now someone's saying, please don't. So, so in Aristotelian philosophy, there's an idea of the true substance of something is a perfect form. It actually comes from Plato first, where Plato says there's a perfect form, there's a perfect door, and every door we see is a poor reflection of the real door. The people we see are a poor reflection of what's really real. And so the substance of bread and wine, all bread and wine in the world are a poor reflection of that. Um, that adoption of Aristotelian metaphysics then said, through the transubstantiation of the blessing of communion, the bread and the wine still look and taste like bread and wine. But the metaphysical substance of what they were are no longer tied to bread and wine. They're now tied to Jesus Christ. And so the bread and wine become the body and blood of Christ. In the in Protestant world, um, we will say... It is done in remembrance of Jesus and represents the body and blood of Christ but isn't transubstantiated in that way. So the good news is regardless of your belief in Aristotelian metaphysics, you are welcome to take communion. Amen? And part of the reason the United Methodist Church doesn't have rules about who can and cannot take communion because most churches do by the way. It's not just the Catholic Church. Catholic Church has rules. Baptist Church has have rules. Lots of folks have rules about who can take it. Some churches you have to be baptized. Some churches you have to be confirmed. Some churches you have to be a member of that church. Um, some you have to be a member of that church in good standing. What? That would thin the crowd. We'd go with a half loaf. Amen? Um... But in the United Methodist Church, according to John Wesley, it's not, it's not just the bread and the wine, but it's the miracle of transformation when we make a decision for Jesus Christ. John Wesley thought just by taking communion, you could be converted to Christ. Just by taking communion, by making that decision that it was a, it was a saving act, that God has a way of transforming you even when you're not looking for it or trying. And I will say much of the transformation I've experienced in my life has been against my better judgment, not because of it. And so as you receive communion today, we will bless it. And we do believe that the Holy Spirit transforms that bread and that grape juice. Amen. We're so faithful, we believe we can call grape juice wine. I'll go through that history another day. We believe that the Holy Spirit transforms that, and when we come forward to receive the grace of Jesus Christ, it's us that's transformed. It's us that's transformed. And that's the miracle I want you to experience today.
we're not going to have a big wine party today. We're going to receive communion. And the invitation to transformation is the one that Jesus made at the wedding at Cana. The first miracle he performed in the Gospel of John. And only in John did he perform this miracle. The first miracle he performed was a miracle of transformation from water, which is what we are, mostly water, into the best wine ever, which is the goal of the life of faith, is to be transformed into something like Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we thank you. We thank you for all the church's struggles for the last 2,000 years to make sense of Jesus and his miracles. Lord, sometimes the church gets it right, sometimes it gets it wrong. Sometimes the preachers get it right, sometimes they get it wrong. But despite all of that, your miracle of transformation at the wedding of Cana continues to speak to us today and continues to offer the invitation to transformation in Jesus Christ. Lord, as we receive the bread and wine today, we ask that we might be transformed just as Jesus transformed the wine. We ask this in his holy name. Amen. Let's prepare our hearts and minds for Holy Communion.